Hey, welcome back, Golden Bear family. We're now on chapter 3.5 and 3.6. And when I left you last, America has clunched the deal. They have finished off what they started. Uh, it took them a major kind of cataclysmic event, so to speak, in order to achieve the great American Revolution. But we now find ourselves successful in that. But now what? We've finished the party. We finished the great event, the finished the great concert, whatever. Now we got to clean up this stuff to figure out what we're going to do next. But before we dive in, let me tell you kind of a little story of myself. Um, you might not look at my frame of body now, but I used to be an avid surfer, uh, going every summer to Santa Cruz, meeting my wife there. Uh, I can't think of a summer since 89 that I've never uh, spent up there in Santa Cruz. And there's one spot that uh, I have come to surf uh, at often and get to know it's called steamer lane now steamer lane in the summer uh, in, in in the early fall months is really chill but when the su winter months hit steamer lane used to be one of the bigger waves across the landscape of america specifically the west coast i'm talking waves of 22 to 25 feet well i was there one uh, late fall and uh, some buddies of mine who live up there year round they go hey Fresh, Steger, let's go and let's let's go get this wave. It's not that crowded. It should be good. So we get there to the lighthouse, and my my eyes are like big. My stomach is in my my heart is in my stomach, and you can the wave at the middle peak was so kind of big. You can when it would crash, you can hear the collapse <laughs> crashing outside. You can kind of feel the shutter on the on the cliffs above. And I, come on, let's get in. Now I don't need to tell you about if I did well, did I not do well. The point of the story is is that we had to actually, waves uh, were so big and the white water was so big, there's no way we can paddle through or around unless we want to paddle like, it seemed like a mile or so to get out there. We had to hike out onto this ledge, walk out on this ledge, where it all says, warning, do not go out on this ledge. And we had to hold our, our boards and we had to wait for the big waves to crash in the white water. And we had to jump in just at the right time. So that way we wouldn't have this major long fall. And then what even made it more freaky is then once we jumped and landed in the water, then we had to clamber for our board and paddle and time it just right before the next wave hit. Or otherwise, yeah, you can imagine kind of disastrous inside the rocks and everything else like this. And so scary day, scary opportunity. But I can look back if I'm standing here, that means good news. Uh, in terms of that why do i tell you this is that steamer lane was about a critical entry point and i had to time it had to figure out what we we're going to do had to make sure how i was going to do this have if a possible an escape route etc but mostly i just had to jump in and that's exactly what the framers of our constitution had to do the framers everybody from james madison to uh, thomas jefferson wasn't really invited that's a whole other story uh we had hamilton but uh you know, we had a lot of folks that, that needed to be part of this that uh, just didn't know what to do, but they had a clear idea as to maybe how they would approach it. And so this is a unique story of the American Revolution or post-American Revolution. So with that, on this section here, we're going to talk about kind of how did the colonies come together, 13 loosely knit colonies, and how did they come together and form a common identity? And the second part is how then should we structure the government? You need to recognize that then there were some distinctions. Were we the United States with individually doing their own thing, or were they the United States coming under one purpose, one umbrella? And so this is the differences and distinctions that we hope to kind of be paying attention to as we go through today's thing. Uh, you should have received or downloaded this document that will help you kind of go through in your reading and also in my lecture because there are some things about the Articles of Confederation. Some call it the Articles Confusion, and you'll see why, um, and that are important for you to know is the reason why we then had to go get the, dec the um, Constitution done and the Bill of Rights, uh, what we'll get to a little bit later. Well, how did these states begin to move? The revolution comes to an end. Each state says, great, I'm glad I did my contributions. It's like we threw a big party. Everybody leaves and goes home. Who's going to clean up this mess? Well, they basically said, we don't ever want to have a strong government. We don't want to have a king ever tell us what to do um, or president or anything like that. We just want to kind of do our own thing. And so this is where each state kind of went back and they were relegated to control things as they deemed fit. Virginia, as the largest uh, colony of the Union, continued to determine how they wanted to trade with other countries, how they wanted to trade with in other states, as we call them, or other colonies. Everything they just did was on their own. 
Some states adopted their old constitutions. Some states wrote new constitutions with Massachusetts leading the way as to probably the longest withstanding um, constitution that shows equity and parity to the common man and the common citizen, the Republican ideal that I talked about in two lectures ago about where the right to government comes through the person, not through the king or from God itself. And so many people kind of just adopted by virtue this Virginia's model that there should be rights and constitutions afforded to the people. They don't ever want to have a tyrannical king uh, telling them or queen telling them what to do. And, and they needed those freedoms protected. One of them was this idea of the religious freedom and, and then the prohibition that um, essentially anybody with titles shouldn't have a way to walk around and kind of thump on their chest. This is interesting because about two years before the actual, the, um, the end of the American Revolution occurred, many loyalists had fled the Carolinas, had fled the south of Georgia, had fled the region of, of Virginia, had returned back to England not knowing what would happen. Um, when they came back, they recognized that huh, their titles and other things weren't going to be respected on this American soil. So what were the Articles of Confederation or Articles of Confusion that we like to call them? And why was there a need to do that? Well, essentially, our government couldn't operate without some sort of document that tells other nations like France or Spain or um, Germany that we were a legitimate country that had documents to, to convey um, what was the logical line of authority. And so with that, this article of confederation essentially loosely stated two things that uh, they that they'll have the right to tax each state but only with their permission and they'll have a right to um, engage in conversations with other countries and then the other thing is they'll have the right to uh, form a, a, a military if needed very limited because who was going to enforce these things who would have to listen to them it's like hi here's my dinner tab well, let me send the dinner tab to Virginia because they, it was their dinner. And what's Virginia going to say? Well, what are you going to do? I'm not going to pay the bill because I already ate the dinner and, you know, good luck collecting that from me. Please know that there were some strengths and there's some weaknesses to that. I'm not going to talk about them, but you need to go back and use this as a way to fill in your document there that I provided for you. That um, the, the strengths I'm going to talk about here in a moment is that it did bring us together loosely. It did acknowledge that we have our own identity as 13 colonies, but it also determined how would this debt from the revolution be paid. And the best way, best way to describe it is it dealt with land. And so I'm going to talk about that as to how that would become significant in repaying our debts. Well, in terms of a review, you got to remember that you know, by the time for us to get here, there was a sequence of events that took place. The first was the First Continental Congress, which was like an olive branch of the king saying, hey, yo, we're frustrated. Hey, yo, we don't want to leave, uh, the, the, you know, your protection. We just got to let you know that we, we don't like this idea of, of this virtual representation. You get to tell us how, you know, how to run things over here. You keep taxing us. You, you need to respond to that. The king dismisses it. Then the Second Continental Congress emerges. That's what makes Washington become... Our, our uh, leader, we have the Continental Ar Army that emerges, and then we have full-on revolutionary war leading against them. At the end of the war, we have the Articles of Confederation that we're talking about now, which I call it Government 1.0, and then we have uh, the 2.0 that I'll talk about in the subsequent lectures. Well, there were economic challenges that were basically, that was gonna, that would unrival, not unrival, unravel, that's the better word, unravel um, America as we know it. Um, these, you need to recognize that Europe was sitting back watching, like, I don't think these guys are going to make it. Europeans, we couldn't figure it out. When we would conquer and vanquish new areas, we'd say, sure, you guys can set up whatever system you want, but ultimately they would economically couldn't become viable. Every one of them were sitting back waiting for the colonists to have an explosion pretty soon turning on each other. What would that mean? Oh, the France will move in, Spain will move in. It'll be as though they never had the wars before and they'll still get to get back the land that they want. Pretty smart move. But with these economic challenges, it was the colonies that had to rep recognize what is going to become our common identity and what's going to keep us linking together. That's the mystery of this. What was it? I don't know, but it's it's really a unique aspect in history. So what was the big issues? Tons of people were were 
were owed money for fighting in the military campaigns for the colonists and their liberty. I mean, in fact, some stories go that they didn't get repaid for 20 years because each state didn't have the funds, except for Virginia, to do this, the most populous state and the one with the most amount of land. You know, poor little Maryland, uh, they didn't have any land. New Hampshire, they didn't have any land. So this new nation was trying to, you know, figure out how they're going to pay their how pay their old debts, how they're going to trade with new countries that might want to trade with them, and how they're going to kind of deal with the other countries that weren't happy that we got a revolution. England's like, sure, you just won, but we're going to deny you any access points to various ports and regions across the globe. Spain, you can't use New Orleans to do some uh, shipping with. The Native Americans on the interior were linking up more with Spain and, and France um, and, and England. And the Barbary pirates, the look them up, but those are like, you know, the Jack Sparrows of the world that were attacking U.S. merchant ships because everybody knew in the world, U.S. didn't have any navy whatsoever. Attack their ships, it's on their own, and take whatever you wanted. Kind of an easy time for people to be picking on, on, on the Americans at this time. Well, there were conflicts over the Western lands, and essentially you need to remember this. Not every state or every colony had open lands. Virginia and New York had tons of open land that was theirs. How? By the original charters given to them by the king way back to 1607 to 1619 and 1633, etc. Okay? This gave them the luxury of choosing as more people arrived, the luxury of selling off more lands. What did that mean? They got to pay off debts and become very legitimized across uh, European. European says, oh, Virginia pays their debts back to us. Let's keep doing trade with them. Poor New Hampshire, they got nothing to pay things with, so they have debt still, and the Europeans are like, we can't trade with you because you already owe us too much money. So it was this whole idea that the Continental Congress had to come together to struggle. What do we do with all these lands? We know that's going to be the best benefit, but Virginia and, and New York are like, not our, not our worry. We paid everything. You got to deal with it. Pennsylvania right next door is like, but if you help us, New Hampshire, if you help us, Rhode Island, if you help us, it was this land thing and this compromise that we'll talk about here shortly that basically enabled the Articles of, of um, Confederacy to actually become very, very successful with that. So there you see some other trips in Ohio River Valley. So please remember the war, the seven-year war that we spent a lot of time unpacking here at the start of, of this um, time period. And the seven-year war began dividing up different parts of regions of the colonies that were, were French and that were Spanish, but now are falling under um, colonial control. And so you can see the part here, how much Virginia owes and has all the way up around the Great Lakes. You can see Carolina has modern day Tennessee. You see Georgia having parts in the South. It's crazy amount of space and land that they have. And so what's going to come from that is, is basically um, a, a, this two treaties are going to, uh, not treaties, but decisions are going to be made where we're going to say, hmm, let's create a treaty with the Native Americans so that way we promise. I know the proclamation line of 1763 was designed um, by, by the King of England and we agreed to that, but we still need more land. And so here we see the Iroquois again kind of being hoodwinked, um, not kind of were hoodwinked by another American policy to give up uh, land uh, by themselves. And, and this is going to take us on another hundred year cycle of continued um, kind of uh, punishment and mistreatment of the Native Americans just because we want more and more land um, during that time. And the Northwest Land Ordinance was unique. And I'm going to show you a picture of that here shortly as to it basically came to an agreement where Virginia and New York ha and some of uh, Carolinas had to say, fine. We do believe in this idea of 13 unified colonies. We just don't want to have a big government telling us what to do. And so with that, we're going to provide an orderly system in which these territories are going to be drafted. And so there was a Land Ordinance Act of 1785 that was drawn up that basically started um, um, what they call it when they measure and survey. That's the word survey entire regions. Why is this important? Because Prior to this in the Hudson Valley, prior to this in the Ohio River Valley, people just kind of made these treaties with these Native Americans and then remember the one day walking and they would say, yeah, that's all of my land right there. There was nothing definitive. 
Here, our government stepped in and said, because this Land Ordinance Act of 1785, it said these quadrants are going to be where towns can be set up for every six miles. And inside those towns, you have quadrants of, of those 36 or so. The, each quadrant, so much of it has to go towards building of a school or of a college or for public care and welfare. It's a really cool and unique system for that. This legacy still exists today. I don't know if you've ever flown across the Midwest uh, as you go to the East Coast, but you still see tremendous amounts of influence that this the Northwest Ordinance had, as well as this Land Ordinance of 1785. So this was a brilliant strategy um, by our government to help um, pay back the debts of that time. Number four, we're talking about now indebted farmers. Um, they are feeling the pinch of inflation. They're feeling the government that is not responding to their needs. They're feeling this sense that these elitists, remember, this wasn't really a revolution per se. We call it American Revolution. But compared to France, compared to Russia, that was completely cataclysmic where you have the poor taking over the rich and the established. No, here it was, huh? Before the American Revolution, it was the conservatives and the loyalists controlling things. After the American Revolution, we still have the conservatives and not so much the loyalists, but controlling things, truly. And so it, it wasn't much of a shift and much of a change. We call it a revolution, but it really wasn't that. And so there were some people who were starting to get very upset because the debts weren't being repaid. The inflationary value of each colony printing their own money was not working. And so farmers who fought became incredibly, incredibly bummed about this. And so there was one guy there, uh, Daniel Shays, who was a farmer from Massachusetts. I'm telling you, Massachusetts has a lot of people who have a lot of anger issues, and they're the ones that lead the charge for change. But um, these folks are really uh, working hard to kind of reach out and raise awareness to what is happening. Basically, how the locals um, were not listening to their needs. What does Daniel Shays do? He leads this rebellion and basically goes, knocks on the front steps of the local governor's house and everybody's freaking out and they realize there's nobody there to do anything about a Daniel Shays. There's no federal uh, military that's gonna allow them to come in and quell this local disturbance. And it basically realized that, that um, if they don't do something, they need to kind of find out our country is going to become dismayed and, and disintegrated. And so there was a call to meet again to declare these Articles of Confederation perhaps not as effective as they were, uh, and we need to make some desperate changes to them. So by way of summary, recognize that um, America was debating how, just like me debating, should I jump off this ledge and into the cold ocean water, putting my life at risk to catch this wave, so did the people have to debate what would the national government look like? Um, would it be for the state's rights? Would it be for the federal rights? And you need to recognize that there was still a lot of internal conflicts going on between the Native Americans, the, the farmer, uh, the weak Articles of Confederation that was not doing much to prepare for the people. Hey there, Golden Bears. Good to see you back again. We now have module 3.6 together today, reframing the American government. And the last time we talked about what was America going to do post the revolution and what would the struggles be both as a colony, but also under the leadership of a major government. Today, we're gonna to talk about what that government should look like and how there wasn't even agreement on what that government should look like. But before we do, let me tell you another story about Steger's land here. Well, my story starts in my freshman year at uh, UC Riverside. We called it lovingly UC Reject, but you know, go Bears. Um, in high school, if you were to see me, I didn't change a whole lot of how I dressed. Uh, I would always wear the latest uh, cool band t-shirt because that's what you had to do to reflect what kind of group you were in. So it was either Cotterly Scorpions or uh, uh, let's see, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, all these kind of 70s groups that were kind of no longer cool, but were cool to us because that's kind of what reflected our timepiece. It had to be then Levi's and a pair of these Puma shirt, shoes that everybody had to wear. I did everything I could to possibly conform. But when I went off to college, I'm like, man, maybe it's time for Steger to get a new look. And it was then that I started listening to more of The Cure, more of Depeche Mode, uh, more of NXS, kind of more of this modern 
rock type of thing. So I began changing how I look. I didn't do the total goth emo look before it was even emo with the lipstick and the black hair because I didn't have enough hair at that point to begin with. But I do remember distinctly kind of wearing collared shirts I'd flip up. I'd roll my pant, uh, they call it pegging, pegging your, your jeans. I changed the type of shoes that I wore. I kind of just dressed up a little bit more fashionable to reflect more of what a mod that would be kind of look to have. Um, I remember going back to like a high, the Friday uh, homecoming after I'd already graduated and people were like, dude, check out Steger, man. He's all collaged up, looking good. And I don't know what prompted me to do this, but it was a fresh start, new beginning, new everything, time to reinvent who you are and what you wanted to be. And so for me, I went from like a working class mindset of, of high school to now I want to be sophisticated, respectful mindset here in college. This is a lot of like two people groups that we're going to see, uh, basically encouraged by these these men. I encourage you, first of all, if you don't know anything about the Constitution, how to construct it, watch this 24 minute video. You will not be disappointed in that. But I was kind of representing like what this worksheet is talking about. You had the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. You had the Federalists who are trying to represent everything the government can bring. That would be the Adam, uh, that, I'm sorry, that would be the um, Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton would be on this list. George Washington would be on this list. Uh, John Jay would be on this list. These are the distinguished fellows with whom sophisticated conservatives uh, liked and, and were drawn towards. The anti-federalists were the Thomas Jeffersons out there who were like the sluggers, the farmers, the fighters, the ones who were in debt, the ones who didn't trust government and anything like that. They were the boxing sort. And so it's interesting that I would have been kind of seen as an anti-federalist in high school, but when I went off to college and the elitist that I wanted to become, I was a federalist in my mindset. So I'd hope that word picture kind of helps make sense and resonates with you as we begin seeing how are these two groups going to come together and kind of to form a new constitution that some felt didn't need any changing. Well, 55 delegates met at this constitutional convention. They didn't meet there because they initially wanted to be, but a year before this young and upstart 31-year-old Alexander Hamilton kind of came together to say, basically the government's in debt. There's no way we're going to pay for these things. We need to do something. But he realized quickly that, huh, there weren't that many delegates there. Two, if we talk about money, no one will show. But if he said, we have a weak Articles of Confusion, I mean, Articles of Confederation, we need to make changes that might get more people there. And sure enough, Philadelphia, 1787, tons of delegates showed up. Now, interestingly enough, the delegates who were the firebrands of the revolution, the Patrick Henrys, the Lees, the, the uh, Thomas Jefferson, they weren't there. Only the sophisticated, well-to-do, well-bred, well-soft-spoken-minded people were invited. And in fact, Samuel Adams from Massachusetts put his name to be on the list to go. They fly outside up. No, nope, you're too much of a firebrand. We don't want you there. Kind of an interesting thing of, of how there's a time for military and there's a time for politicians to do their uh, work. And so this seemed to be a time, if we're talking about government, let's let the politicians do politicking, politicking. And when it was time for war, let's have the war firebrands do their time for war. Hmm. Kind of a modern day application for something from 1787. But you do need to know the two aspects of the plans that were put forward. You have the Virginia plan, the large states it's called, and it was in the Virginia plan, which was the most populated plan. It was to their best interest to kind of make sure that everything that happens in the government as we they want to realign it would be to their favor, tipping to the larger government. They figured, you know, representation, it's not, it's crucial, but we want to make sure that we are the most represented because we think that's the most fair. They're the ones that put forward this idea of a bicameral house, which means two houses, which um, basically means like an early level of a, a legislative where we have the Senate and where we have the, the Senate. But how they were selected, uh, you know, the New Jersey people didn't like. Who were these New Jersey people? They were the small states that didn't have enough uh, of the representation based on the Virginia plan that, that was calling for. And so they felt there should be equal representation, not based on population like the Virginia plan. So they came up with a compromise. Why don't we have a bicameral legislature and that will give equal representation? This will be done by a census that is done every 10 years. Hence the reason why by law we have to do the census, whether it's 2020 and we have the COVID epidemic coming across 
the, the universe or a, a war or anything, our government works hard to make sure that our census are taking place. Well, what plan is ultimately chosen? It will be a blending of the two, of which it takes hard work to get there. Who is striking out against this? Well, if Virginia, which are predominantly slave owning, want to do this for once in their final God green earth, they, time, they finally agree to, is that they say, well, if it's based on population, we want to for sure include those who are our slaves because we believe they're worthy of counting as a vote. And they were called bluffed by plenty of people in the North saying, hmm, well, if you're going to call them as a vote, then we should be entitled to call for all of our horses sitting around here on our streets as well. Well, both sides, and please don't take that as a disrespect or meant to be a slam. This is legitimate history here. How it was spoken in the time. And so there was a compromise saying that slaves only count as three-fifths of a vote, and that's the ongoing continued travesty of a constitution that will be drafted, that we will see its short-sightedness with regard to different people groups here in the American landscape. The final thing that will be determined on this constitution and what needs to be addressed is what do we do with all the new land that's going to be opened up? What about the Northwest Territories? What will, what will those look like? Will they allow slaves or not slaves? And so the general compromise was is, fine, you Southerners, you can have your three-fifths compromise. We will count, you know, three-fifths of a slave as long as you agree that any other state that opens up, that slavery will not be allowed uh, in that region. They compromised and they came away with a possible good conclusion to that. Some other debates that were talked about, remember, we had a revolution from a tyrannical type of king who, who wanted to run things from a strong sense of federal power. Well, they didn't like that. They, the, since the revolution, they're like, no, each state should have their own right to make decisions. Um, we don't want to have a federal government telling us what to do. And so they were really uh, alarmed that there was a new movement of Alexander Hamilton and George Washington and John Jay to begin saying, no, for us to be work worthwhile as a country, we have to make a strong constitution that declares that a central power is in control of things. And boy, where well, there's a lot of people kicking and screaming with regard to that. Well, in this idea, in this constitution, it talked about all sorts of things that you can read there that you're probably familiar with in terms of who's going to be elected, how they get elected. This is a great compromise, so that way the, the New Jersey plan people would be happy and content. The Virginia people recognize that they still have population um, things. The senators would be chosen by a six-year term, Every two of them selected for every state of the union, not just based on population. A lot of cool things happen. That the president be elected by electoral college, but a question mark there, are we still needing that? That's a great conversation piece, given that it was done to make sure that the mob rule effect wouldn't take place by ignorant people, like in France or other places in Europe that they had shown or will show themselves to do. This is a way to protect themselves. Is that a viable thing that's needed anymore, since most of Americans have a high school degree or more? Supreme Court justices were chosen, three branches that were chosen, you name it, that finally, the Constitution, after over, golly, nine months of fighting and in bickering, and by the way, all kept in secrecy there in Philadelphia. Secrecy. They did not want the nation to know that they were actually undoing the Articles of Confederation because it was too limited. They were beginning to recognize that there needed to be a Constitution that dramatically affected this. Well, once they determined what was happening, they ratified it and they approved it, they sent this constitution out to all the people, all 13 colonies to look at it, and you begin seeing a division between the two. The Federalists who are in favor of the constitution and the Anti-Federalists who says, no, this is a this is a power grab and a money grab, to, to and we, we don't like that. So please recognize that you see key players emerging uh, that, that soon, because the country was needed to argue and recognize, well, yeah, the Articles of Confederation have tremendous limitations, where at the same time they did protect uh, from tyranny from a government. These two camps began going on a like a campaign. It's like a Twitter campaign, a political campaign, and it was all done throughout the public newspapers. So the Federalists, John Jay, Hatt Madison, and Hamilton, privately, nobody knew who these authors were, would write these, pen these letters and have them printed out in response, and you would have the Anti-Federalist Jefferson and others of them would respond back uh, and say why it was wrong. 
and the Americans got to read what was right and wrong about these ideas that were going upon the Constitution. And, and with this, this is what enabled really this idea of a Bill of Rights to come in as a compromise. That the, the Anti-Federalists, Thomas Jefferson, said there's no way we will ever approve of this. But some bright person came along and says, well, what if we give you a Bill of Rights to assure you that the government and its strong central powers will not overrun you and overrule your rights to privacy? And they're like, hmm, that sounds good. And we can work on those details later if you promise that you put it in. Yeah, we promise it will put it in. And so we have George Washington and John Adams taking office there on that particular time. So we need to recognize that these debates will not be over, but these debates were necessary to clarify the weakness of the Articles of Confederation, but the dire need to have a declaration redone um, that will also then lead us to 